Right. I hope I'll have my full uh, 15 minutes because uh, I've written it with uh, smaller font and margins. Okay. So um, I'm going to speak about um, my, my critique on the commons as practiced today, uh, as performed today, um, rests on three concepts, uh, class, occupation, by which I mean a pascholisi in Greek, and the inside. And um, class is the last one to come, and I'm very keen to speak about that. So um, starting straight away and where possible, I have made connections to art, but I believe the problematic exceeds the parameters of uh, speaking about art. So the first, um, the first issue, which I call the commons of the inside, is a problem identified by Massimo De Angelis in 2013, uh, and he called it the commons fix, or the capitalism commons monster. Um, wh what he says in that paper, uh, actually the two papers, um, dealing with the same issue. He says that uh, at this very moment, and this was mentioned this morning, um, uh, capital does need, uh, does need the commons. It needs to promote uh, the commons uh, because since neoliberalism is not about to give up its management of the world, uh, it will have to ask the commons to manage the devastation it creates, is what he writes. And uh, if the commons are not there, he says quite importantly, capital will have to promote them somehow, right? It's a very complicated phrase that the capital has to promote uh, the commons. And um, the Angelis does not take this uh, uh, perspective, in my view, uh, to its logical and rather unsettling conclusion, which would be that in some cases, what appears as the commons and a relation among social agents that returns labor activity, its outputs and outcomes to a praxis emancipated from capitalist relations of production and of consumption is ideologically sustained by capital as such, right? And the question I need to pose in relation to this is how can we know what are the indicators to be used so as to distinguish between a commons subsumed to capital and a commons that is not? And of course, this becomes very uh, much harder to answer if we accept that uh, globalization exists primarily as a biopolitical reality uh, regulated by the needs of capital, that is, that there is no outside, so every, all, all the commons, you know, are inside. Um, so th that, that's quite important. And there is certainly evidence that capital is promoting the commons uh, at present. I would say that uh, the culture of solidarity we have in relation to refugees and so on. Uh, the example, again, mentioned this morning about uh, David Cameron, uh, Britain's uh, prime minister, uh, kind of invoking a big society that is having volunteers run libraries, right? Um, so the distance crossed in the management of destruction since the 80s when we had this kind of save yourself individualism with Margaret Thatcher. And uh, art has been uh, a, a, a very important participant um, in, in this process uh, because of course already in the 90s uh, in this DIY culture, I, I'm definitely old enough to, to remember this, uh, for example, Wochen Klaus's uh, Clinic for the Homeless in Vienna from the early 90s, 93, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, this later on became uh, a much more widespread phenomenon. We see it here in Athens too. And of course, we have in art, in art theory, I mean, I'll just mention Claire Bishop, a very strong critique of the receding state, okay, where art, the commons in art or the commons outside art um, create this capitalism commons master, right? And I'll have to say that the, the question I need to pose is, is art actually where the capitalism commons monster not only becomes centrally visible, but is also glorified as an avant-garde uh, uh, tied to uh, some kind of revolutionary uh, prospects? Um, the above summarize a major contradiction of the commons in the historical conditions of today, um, that the disenclosure of social reproduction, the commoning of care, functions as a form of social forgiveness of the state's betrayal uh, of the workers, and it's a solution without, uh, without, without uh, sorry, it's a problem without a solution rather at, at present, the same way that it was a problem without a solution, um, how are we going to socialize, you know, care, which the, 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 the Italian, um, Silvio Federici said that, it comes very much from Italian Marxism as well, and so on. And I move on to the second point, where, uh, which I call the commons as occupation, um, and the abandonment of a discourse certain on the public 
uh, in favor of a discourse centered on the commons is, is a problem, and anyone teaching students, we, we somehow always have to address this question, what happened, I teach the period like from the 60s to date, and the brighter students always um, come up and say, but, but in the 80s and even in the 90s, we have the concept of the public, why since 2000 we revert to the concept of the commons? And they want to know both the difference between the two terms and, of course, why this, this uh, substitution has taken place. Um, as James Gilligan argues, for the commons to be embraced in economic, ecological, and social policy, their immediacy should be apparent to everyone. Um, the cognitive apprehension of common goods must quicken our capacity to experience and understand the things we share beyond the enclosed spaces of private and public property, private and public property. So that said, there is no doubt that such collective apprehension does not exist. Most struggles today, including those in Greece, uh, focus on rescuing goods from private property and reinstating them as public property. Capital's attack on public property under the austerity dogma plays therefore a double role. It both delivers to capital, whatever it can, right, and idealizes public property as the goal of popular struggles. In feeding this binary, capital succeeds in depriving the struggle, for, the struggle for the commons of collective effort and possibility because we are a society steeped in property relations and so returning goods uh, to public property is comprehensible reformist, whereas uh, claiming goods as part of the commons is revolutionary fiction. So when students ask the question concerning the historical turn from the public to the common, to the commons rather, the answer can only entail a contradiction that divides the struggle. Making demands on the state primarily means demanding goods as public property, whereas true emancipation means that uh, we have organized so as to bypass the state. And I think the demand about public education, right, um, and which direction the student movement should take towards public property or towards the University of the Commons, right, would be the typical example. I believe actually there's a book under that title, the University of the Commons. Anyway, as regards art, the fundamental question that arises is whether public funding, public funding, we don't call it commons funding, imposes an, uh, on art the condition of a public good that effectively eliminates the possibility of art as commonwealth. In fact, the demand of artists' uh, wages, uh, about which I talked at former West, um, kind of in Vasa recently, um, so that the, Right, where was I? Somewhere here. Uh, the demand for artists' wages, which is a radical demand, perpetuates, ideologically at least, uh, the ties of art to public property, to the state as the regulator and guarantor of such property, rather than uh, freeing art as commonwealth. And in the context of property relations, art as commonwealth would mean that art would become an occupation rather than a profession, which is how Hito Styrel starts what for me is her more convoluted uh, essay, uh, that she says what used to be work uh, has been turned into occupation. In this essay, which I can't begin to summarize here, one idea is recurrent that occupation has no definitive outcome and it keeps busy a large number of people with undifferentiated roles. It keeps people occupied, but basically these people need to make a living. They need to reproduce themselves somewhere else, as somewhere else on which they are dependent, of course, for their own reproduction. And realize within capitalist relations of production, Art as common wealth means that art that remains, recogni remains recognizable as, as aesthetics, not as labor, and it is not a good idea. In fact, I would say it's a counter-revolutionary idea because it answers uh, Walter Benjamin's question, this very famous question in uh, the author as producer, how does art stand within relations of production? It answers this question as follows. Art has got nothing to do with relations of production and therefore with class struggle. I'm therefore uh, wondering whether the aspiration to have an art as common wealth realized under the hegemony of property, yeah, because our conditions are specific, gives us an art of withdrawal rather than an art of political urgency. And such a realization would mean that the invocation of the commons rather than the public in recent years ends up as art's disempowerment, shifting attention from the production of occupation of public space where antagonisms abound uh, to the production and occupation of the commons as a site rescued uh, from antagonism. And I'll come to my third and final point, the commons versus class. Now, as a practice of self-organized collective labor that returns outputs and outcomes as wealth uncorrupted by profit as common good, the commons remain frightfully unclear 
when realized within such a society of class antagonisms. On the one hand, the commons can be seen as an element of class struggle insofar as uh, it permits the, extric the, the extraction, the extrication of certain goods, uh, including services, from capitalist accumulation, fine. But to begin with, who is in practice the beneficiary of the goods generated by the commons? To whom is this commonwealth returned? Uh, can we answer actually uh, these two questions without considering the class composition of the commons as a site of production in relation to the class composition of society at large as a site of production? The assumption that those participating in the commons leave their class and enter a context free of class struggle does not hold. On the one hand, making goods common can only be of interest to a working class, um, locked in permanent battle with capital, right? For example, setting up a nursery that constitutes a commons is of benefit to parents and children from this class. There is do not need a nursery that constitutes a commons, in addition to having every interest to, to, to prevent in most cases. So in this very simple case, the so-called common goods are not common goods. They're class-specific goods, and we really need to, to, to grasp that. And also at present, practices of the commons face precisely the impossibility of the common good. The common good is at the very least a non sequitur, a logical impossibility in a society of class antagonism. It doesn't exist. At the most, the common good is a mystifying concept set in motion to deflect attention from the actuality of class struggle, the, cr the class struggle constituted in and through material conditions. And there is a, a brilliant essay I urge you to read by Jennifer Cotter, uh, writing in The Red Critique. Uh, you can find it online, it's from 2012, where she says, uh, whether or not the society has the power to end starvation or to condemn the majority of the laboring population to a lifetime of salvation, as it happens in Africa, for example, has to do with a level of development of its material conditions of production, its forces of production, and the social relations of production, the labor and property relations that determine the social ends and interests towards uh, which labor is put. This is another way of saying that power is the historical and material and effect of labor in the form of property, and it's not this abstract concept um, that Foucault deals with, he discusses Foucault extensively in this essay. In a society in which property is, pri is privately owned, power is the capacity of the ruling class to command over the surplus labor of workers in production, and that's stated in the German ideology, um, as the root of power relations is an antagonistic class relation, the, the antagonism between the owners of the means of production and workers who only own their labor to sell in order to survive and are exploited. Now, based on the, on the above, it becomes near impossible to not answer the students, my students, asking about the turn to the commons, that the latter concept emerged in globalization as a substitute for a defeated working class politics. This is what the commons is. It has been a well-received substitute precisely because the immense totality and unknown totality of capital as globalization drives a desire for equally enormous counter-generalities. But what class interests, such as uh, such counter generalities, ultimately serve is in the always specific conditions of the commons articulation is another matter and it must be urgently addressed. Do I have time for my three points of conclusion or not? Perhaps you can negotiate with somebody else. Yes, we do. Okay. There, it's this, this part of the page. So, um, first, first is to devise practices that claim back actual articulations of the commons from the function as remedy for the receding state, the state is withdrawing, in acknowledging this, this, this appearance, that the appearance of the commons does not mean the dissolution of the state. We can have as uh, you know, many commons as we want, the state will not go away, but uh, it can perfectly legitimate the latter's withdrawal, and this is what so far is being accomplished. Second, is to elaborate on the connection between public property and the commons in support of workers' rights, and we're all workers. I am, I'm a wage, you know, labor pretty much. So, not pretty much, I don't have any other means. Um, since the state is not about to disappear, we need a new synthetic approach that articulates a synergy rather than opposition between public property goods and commons goods. We must not divide this, which is pretty much what I'm getting from theory, uh, invariably. The current conditions of production both serve uh, the interests of the workers and to divide rather than unite these two vectors for workers' rights works for and not against capital. And finally, my third point, 
We need to establish and theorize adequately the connections of the commons with class struggle, not as some abstract motor of history, etc., etc., but as a highly specific daily process carried across the many material ideological sides of production. In short, Marxism, and I do speak as a Marxist and a feminist, must oppose the function of the commons as a post-class theory and practice, bound to generate a gratifying illusion for the few, because we're 500 in this room and there's 5 million in the city who are not here, and they do fight for public goods, for instance, rather than the commons. So, bound to generate a gratifying illusion for the few, rather the transformation of production for everyone, for the many. Thank you.